The Chosen, Season 2, Episode 8, The Mystery of Judas, begins to unfold. Hi, welcome to today's little lesson. Thank you so much for joining me once again here on my back porch. If you're a regular viewer, you know that we have been looking at the ever increasingly popular TV series called The Chosen, historical fiction that is based on the life of Christ as revealed in the four Gospels. And I've become a, a big fan and becoming a bigger fan with every single episode. I just watched the episode eight of season two, the, the season finale, and it was another just masterpiece. If you haven't begun watching The Chosen yet, I'm just highly recommending it. You know, it, it's very worthwhile. Now, it is historical fiction, and so they've taken facts of the Bible, and they've added all these different plausible subplots, and it's very interesting. It has provoked many of us to, like, go back into our Bibles and say, wait, did, you know, it seems like, I, did I miss that in the Bible? And so in our little lessons, we are actually looking at um, if, you know, certain things that, that perhaps are uh, unscriptural, that is, that they contradict the scripture. And I haven't found anything yet, although we have found some things that I think are clearly, you know, not scriptural. Um, nothing that's dangerously unscriptural that would do someone spiritual damage if they watched. I, I, I just have, you know, I can only find enough good things to say about the Chosen series from the acting, from the screenplay, from the cinema photography, uh, the musical score, um, you know, the, the, the stories that have been crafted and the, and the, the subplots around the, 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 you know, the overall plot of, of Jesus' ministry, um, it's all done with excellence. <clears throat> and I've, I've paid it forward, and I'm going to pay it forward some more, as Dallas Jenkins is always asking us to do, because it, it, it's, it, it's worth investing in. Okay, so I'm, I'm sorry that uh, I happen to be a card-carrying member of the Scripture Police, but I've been reading the Bible for about 45 years and teaching it uh, in various capacities, not quite that long, but almost that long. And, and so, you know, I, I'm, I'm watching The Chosen very closely. And this particular episode, Although there are numerous subplots that are developing and they're doing a great job at the character development and the subplot development, it's all done with excellence. Uh, it, it, the, these folks are professionals. Um, this particular episode revolves primarily around Jesus's Sermon on the Mount, which we know is a big deal. It fills up three chapters in Matthew's Gospel, and that apparently is why in the uh, the historical fiction that the writers of The Chosen have come up with regarding the sermon, that they have Matthew helping Jesus prepare his sermon. <laughs> okay, well, that certainly is fictitious, but perhaps it's based upon the assumption that because Matthew recorded it in his gospel, that uh, he likely had, or was most likely of all the others, uh, the one that would have been involved in helping Jesus prepare it, and that's perhaps what helped him to remember it so that he could write it down. I, I, I have to point out that, that Jesus told all of his disciples that after he would leave, he would send the Holy Spirit. And, and one of the things the Holy Spirit would do would be bring to their remembrance all that he had said. So they had supernatural recall given by the Holy Spirit. And so Matthew didn't have to be there as Jesus prepared his Sermon on the Mount in order to, you know, lodge it in his brain so he could later recall it. Okay, so that's one tiny little unscriptural thing that I think that... Um, you know, they've taken some liberty on. The idea of Jesus preparing his sermon, as we have seen in this episode and the previous episode, <clears throat> uh, 
um, you know, and, and going through iterations of it and, and thinking of perhaps, a, you know, oh, I can say it better this way. And in this episode, even asking Matthew his opinion <laughs> of it as Matthew's writing the notes down for it and, 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 and taking some of Matthew's suggestions, okay, and, you know, that, that obviously is fictitious. And remember that Jesus said on several occasions, the words that I speak are not my words, they're the Father's words. And, 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 and he said, I, I can do nothing of myself unless it's something I see the Father do. So that's a little bit cryptic to us, but Jesus spent a lot of time in prayer during his ministry in the early morning hours. And no doubt he wasn't just speaking to his Father, his Father was speaking to him and Jesus perhaps had, you know, very clear instructions from the Father as to what to do, where to go, and and what to say, and so forth. So I think it's I, I think that we're trying to emphasize Jesus' humanity. We've gone a little bit too far on that and making him appear just like maybe a regular preacher who even has pre-sermon jitters because of the size of the crowd. Um, I just never envisioned Jesus being fearful on any any level and, and I'll keep my eyes open in scripture <laughs> you know to see if I ever if I, I could be proven wrong but um, you know Jesus had full command of his his ministry he knew exactly what he was doing and the Sermon on the Mount if the Father had come instead of Jesus he would have said the exact same things because Jesus was and is one with the Father. All right. So th th those are just a, a couple of things. Uh, the idea that there was, you know, an involved preparation on behalf of Jesus' disciples uh, for this sermon is also very fictitious. And I, I think you know, uh, unscriptural if we actually look at what the scripture actually says. But in the chosen, on this episode, you know, they have the disciples talking about how they're going to do crowd control and Nathaniel, the architect, designing a, a platform and a stage with a curtain that Jesus will come out of and a couple of the apostles searching for land that they can use as the location, the venue for, for the sermon and Mary, you know, writing out posters that they can pl plaster around the towns in Cali and so forth to, 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 to name the time and place when everyone should come to the sermon. Of course, you know, I don't think that's actually scriptural. It was well done and all very interesting and entertaining. But if we look at the Sermon on the Mount itself <clears throat> uh, in Matthew chapter 5, um, we, we don't have that. If we, if we back up you know, prior, just a few verses prior to when Jesus begins the Sermon on the Mount into Matthew chapter 4, remember, of course, Matthew didn't write it in chapter and verse, it was just one flowing narrative. But we'll read from Matthew 4, verse number 23. Jesus was going throughout all Galilee. All Galilee. Well, Galilee's a pretty big area in the center of the Sea of Galilee, but a big area in northern Israel. And what was he doing? He was teaching in their synagogues and proclaiming the gospel of the kingdom. So teaching and preaching, and then also healing every kind of disease and every kind of sickness among the people. And so um, that he was an itinerant teacher, preacher, healer, preaching in synagogues all over Galilee. And so everybody in Galilee you know, was hearing about Jesus and he's doing healings and healing every kind of disease and every kind of sickness. Well, you know, word about that, no doubt, spread quickly, far and wide. And so Jesus's popularity just exploded exponentially. And uh, Matthew brings that out in the very next verse, Matthew 4, 24, the news about him spread throughout all Syria. So the news spills across the borders of Israel into Syria, and they, the Syrians, brought to him all who were ill, those suffering with various diseases and pains, demoniacs, epileptics, paralytics, and he healed them. Okay, so that is actually brought out in one of the episodes in, in, in uh, season two. I, I think it was um, the, the praetor of, um, of Capernaum who said we're having trouble now because we have people, foreigners coming across the border. You know, and so that, that's biblical. And, and then Matthew goes on to say, large crowds followed him from Galilee 
and the Decapolis and Jerusalem and Judea and from beyond the Jordan. So, you know, there's international flow of people coming into Israel. And of course, you know, it just makes perfect sense. If someone was doing what Jesus was doing, the miracles, the healings and so forth, this is before, you know, the days of any kind of modern medicine and hospitals and so forth. I mean, you know, there were doctors, but they had not near the knowledge that, you know, has been amassed since then in, in the medical fields. So anyways, this is a way for it, people who can't be healed to be healed. I mean, word travels fast. Anyone who knows a sick person is saying, come, we got to get you to Jesus. All right. So large crowds followed him from Galilee and the Decapolis and Jerusalem. They're coming up from Judea. Uh, and he says, and Judea, and from beyond the Jordan. Well, that's over there in Syria and some of those other nations to the, to the east of Israel. Now, here's where Matthew 5, verse number 1 says, starts. When Jesus saw the crowds, what crowds? The crowds we were just reading about in Matthew 4, 23 and 24. <laughs> you know, international crowds, multitudes of people. So when he saw the crowds, it says, he went up on the mountain and after he sat down, his disciples came to him, and he opened his mouth and began to teach them. Okay, so the, 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 you know this was there was a degree of spontaneity here, where Jesus, you know, th this wasn't a, a planned sermon that was advertised, and they secured the land and they pl plastered you know billboards around and say, "Come to your Jesus on this certain certain date in this certain place." No. It, it, the Sermon on the Mount was spawned because of Jesus seeing this massive crowd. And he goes up, it says he went up on the mountain and he sat down and his disciples came to him. Now, I have been to Israel and there's a couple places where you can go visit that are the alleged spots of the Sermon on the Mount. Of course, I don't think anyone knows for sure. And based upon this information, how would you know? He went up on, uh, you know, on a mountain. Well, there are lots of mountains around the uh, northwestern uh, corner there, of course. Okay, it's all surrounded by mountains, but I've been up on those mountains and even done some filming there a long time ago, and I taught through the Sermon on the Mount there. It was a lot of fun um, on, up on Mount Arabel. But to get from the coast, you know, down on the shores of the Sea of Galilee, to the tops of the mountain, it's quite a hike. I don't know where Jesus started this, but when he saw the crowds, he went up on the mountain, he sat down, after he sat down, his disciples came to him. I, I don't know, you could interpret that as Jesus took, you know, a hefty hike. And only the people that were really interested in hearing him were willing to tromp up the mountain and go hear him. Again, that could be reading too much into it. You know, well, that's what all us preachers and teachers are trying to do, <laughs> trying to get insight. And that's what they're doing at The Chosen as well. <laughs> okay. Um, so any, anyways, that's, uh, that's my take on some of the, you know, this episode of The Chosen regarding the preparation of the Sermon on the Mount. No stage, no curtain, <laughs> no, it's time. <clears throat> okay. And, and, and then Jesus launches in the Sermon Mount. Of course, he, he, he uh, starts off with the Beatitudes uh, because in The Chosen, Matthew wasn't really excited about Jesus' original opening. <laughs> and Jesus does get, and I like that, in The Chosen, they show Jesus is going back to seek his father and he wakes Matthew up early one morning and says, I've got it, I've got it, you know, and it's the Beatitudes. It's that part of the sermon that, that he didn't have before, and now it's going to be added to the sermon. Just the idea that it was all written down in order, and it was in, you know, 20 segments, and, and you know, it was... Uh, Jesus spoke by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, and, and you know... So he, he didn't have to write sermon notes. <laughs> okay. Um, but, but, but anyways, Jesus starts with the Beatitudes. Now, I, I, I liked the dialogue between Jesus and Matthew when Matthew questions all the metaphors. You are the salt of the earth. What does that mean? And he do a very good job of having Jesus explain three possibilities as to what that could mean. And it could mean one of them or it could mean all of them. They're all, they're all good and they're all appropriate. So they did a great job on that. And there's 
one passage there, one, one part there that I really, really liked, and al although, you know, it's not a verbatim quote from Jesus in the Gospels, I think it encapsulates a lot of truth, and so I actually wrote it down here in my notes, um, as, as Matthew is saying, well, you know, why don't you just, after, after Jesus gives the explanation of what it means to be the salt, Matthew says, well, why don't you just say that? <laughs> you know, just tell him like that. And Jesus says, hey, give me, give me a chance to have a little, you know, some poetry here, and then he reminds Matthew about Solomon's metaphors that are, so hard, that are over so many of our heads. And so anyways, Jesus says then to Matthew, this is, I thought, profound. And I think this encapsulates, you know, biblical truth. Jesus said, I told you, these things will make sense to some, but not to others. So, you know, that's, Jesus did say that one time. Uh, when, the, when, the, when, when the disciples asked him, why are you speaking in metaphors and so forth, he, he said, because this is only for a certain group of people. And who are they? They're the hungry ones who will dive deep and ponder and seek for the meaning behind them because they're believers in Jesus. And, and, and that's what they have Jesus go on to say. Jesus says, I don't want passive followers. Well, there you go. I'm glad they said that. You know, thank you, the chosen scriptwriters. And, and then Jesus goes on to say, those who are truly committed will peer deeply into it. This sermon, he says, looking for truth. Wow. Good job. I, I think that, that conveys a lot of truth. And, and there's no doubt, a lot of things Jesus said have us scratching our heads at times, you know. And, and again, because he wants us to ponder and think about it and come to conclusions as to what are what he actually meant. Matthew also noted in The Chosen the imbalance of negative stuff in the, ser in the Sermon Mount versus the positive stuff. And he quotes a few of those things, you know. And I appreciate the script writers for putting that in because anyone who's read the Sermon Mount knows that. Jesus is not like so many modern day preachers who are afraid to say anything that's negative perceived as negative or or challenging to people. And Jesus says to Matthew and the Chosen, what, you want, you want me just to come and say, hey, you've been doing everything right for a thousand years? <laughs> okay, <laughs> all right. Um, I want to also mention, and there's so many things that we could talk about, you know, the, the, lot, lot, lots of great stuff here and, and, uh, and a lot of really biblical stuff, like the, the subplot they're developing with Shmuel. Shmuel, I can't say the guy's name right, the one Pharisee who's, you know, meeting with these, these different religious leaders, and they're, they're using that as a subplot, the, the, the um, debate between two schools of thought amongst Jewish scholars, Hillel and Shimei, I, Shimei, I believe, uh, I'm not sure I'm pronouncing it right, but that's all, that's all historically true, okay, and I'm glad they're bringing that aspect into it, but, but anyways, um, when Matthew questions, what are the Beatitudes all about? Jesus says, it's a map. This is where, you know, you can find me. If you find these kinds of people, this is where you'll, you'll find me. And it is so well done. As Jesus says, blessed are, you know, the poor in spirit. Then there's a flashback to one of his disciples and blessed are the merciful. And there's a flashback to some of the, some of his female followers embracing Mary after she come, came back after her episode of a little bit of backsliding. And, and it's really, it's, it's really beautifully done. Uh, but my tiny little beef with that is, is that I think it strengthens a misconception amongst many Christians that the Beatitudes are kind of like a zodiac sign. Find the one that, you know, represents you. Oh, you're merciful, or, or, or you're pure in heart, you know. Um, and, 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 that's a, that's a misunderstanding. That's a misconception. Jesus is talking about who are the blessed people. And again, it catches, you know, conventional thought by surprise because some of the people he describes are not people that generally people would think, well, you're, you're, you're blessed. But from God's perspective, they are blessed. Why are they blessed? Because they're demonstrating that they're believers in Jesus. They're persecuted for the sake of righteousness. They've mourned for their sins, you know. Um, they hunger and thirst for righteousness. These people believe in Jesus, so they've been transformed by their belief and by the Holy Spirit working in them, and they therefore demonstrate all of these characteristics more or less. And the reason they're blessed is because in the end, they all go to heaven. 
where they see God. See, if, if, if they're like zodiac signs, where you find your zodiac sign, oh, I'm a, I'm, I was born in this time, and so I'm, I'm, a, I'm a Virgo or whatever. So let, you know, if that's how you do it with Beatitudes, then you see, we can have people who will, who, who, who will enter heaven, but who won't see God, because you know, you fit one of the Beatitudes and you, you don't fit the other one, or vice versa. You see God, but you, you will not inherit the king, kingdom of heaven, okay? So you can see, as you summarize the blessings of the blessed, they're all just different ways of saying, you know, in the end, you, you inherit the kingdom. In the end, you go to heaven. In the end, you see God. In the end, you receive, uh, you know, the mercy that Jesus has purchased for you ultimately. And, 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 and these characteristics, every Christian, every true Christian, manifests them more or less to some degree. And doesn't mean you can't improve. And, and become more sanctified and more like Christ. But this is a test of whether you're among the blessed or you're not among the blessed. And you might recall that in Luke's gospel, where Luke, uh, he, he, actually, and, and, and I don't want to, I don't want to get into this too much, but we find a similar passage in Luke it sounds like it's the Sermon on the Mount because it's a lot of the same material, right? And, and But it's not the Sermon on the Mount. Biblical scholars refer to it as the Sermon on the Plain because it happened in a different place. But Jesus, like all itinerant teachers, repeated himself often over and over again. This Sermon on the Mount was not the only time Jesus said the things that he said in the Sermon on the Mount. He said them many times, right? This was core teaching for Jesus. Anyways, what I was saying is, is that... In Luke's gospel, Luke will give the the antithesis. You know, he says, "Blessed are you, but woe to you when all men speak well." So you're blessed if you're persecuted and, and people slander you, but woe if all men speak well of you. So, you know, we can read the Beatitudes and determine: Am I amongst the blessed, or am I not amongst the blessed? Are amongst those who God would say, "Woe to you." So this is Beatitudes are a test to determine whether or not we really have a relationship with God through Jesus Christ. Okay? Okay, uh, now, I've gone so long, 22 minutes already, so I'm, I'm, I'm going to continue this little lesson and the next little lesson, because there's more I want to say, particularly about the uh, introduction of Judas. Oh, my goodness, did the Chosen, this episode, ever do a brilliant job in introducing Judas to into the story. We knew he had to come sooner or later, okay? And a very interesting person. And so far, boy, they, they did a great job in portraying Judas because everyone always just remembers Judas as the bad guy. But that's not how he started. Okay, well... I'll close for now. Uh, if you've never been to davidservant.org, we've got lots of good stuff there for you. Check it out, okay? It's years of content. Until next time, may the Lord bless you.